Football is king on a lot of American campuses, and that's especially true at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, where it has a long and strong tradition. But critics say there's another long-standing SMU tradition, one of cheating in the recruitment of high school football stars. Shady recruiting practices were common in college football in the early 80s. But it was Dickerson's old school that got caught and made an example of. People blamed us like it was our fault, like we did it, we were still there. I'm like, I was in the pros when they got stuff, and I was long gone. I mean, yeah. and you know, it really bothered me for a long time. We went to SMU and loved going to SMU. There were some knuckleheads that were allowed to go to SMU afterwards. And that's, that's the reason for the death penalty. Dickerson's NFL legend would far outweigh the scandal that surrounded him as a Mustang. And it all started with a rookie season for the record books in 1983. I love watching him run. It looked like he never really got hit hard at all. I used to watch him run off tackle, and if the shoulders would come back and the head would come up, he'd go, oh, baby, you know, hey, here he goes. People think that I ran high. I only ran high when I got an open field. If I came through the line of scrimmage, my shoulders were down. So if you came up to hit me, you better bring it. I wasn't an Earl Campbell type, but that wasn't easy to tackle. He just looked like Norm. Just to watch him with the glasses and the goggles and the, and the curl coming out of his helmet. Nice Jerry curl. Only he's had a little bit too much. He had too much Jerry in it. A little too much Jerry. I'd hate to be the maid and had to make up his bed. Oh, my goodness. He was styling, man. I took some of his sunglasses. Aviator with the gradient color thing happening. Got the Jerry curl. That's where I got my Jerry curl from. And he put these goggles on and it looked like Poindexter. The goggles were a necessity. I had to have them. I'm blind as a bat. There's a prescription in those goggles that's so bad that if you put those goggles on, you could put your hand in front of your face, and I guarantee you, you couldn't see your hands. <laughs> I hated the goggles, don't get me wrong, but I feel naked without them. Like I almost like playing without a helmet. No one looked like the rookie from SMU, from head to toe. He got every pad on he could get. You know, he'd go around the line and say, ooh, that's a good pad, let me have that. You go through all the different pads you put on and why that you think a guy like yourself wouldn't wear any. Oh, uh, well, at right, first I was with my knee pads, you know, very thick knee pads. My thigh pads aren't that big. Then my hip pads, they look different than everyone else. They come above my ribs, so I can have my ribs protected. And then I wear a flag jacket, you know, give me extra protection up here. Then I have my pads. Two sponges on each shoulder. Now when my neck roll, and my goggles, and my mouthpiece just goes around my lips. I don't know how you ran so fast with all that stuff on. I saw you running down the field against the Jets. I said, nobody's gonna catch you. that I remember about that run was watching DBs run at him and then all of a sudden they're just reaching at him and they were losing their balance. It was like they weren't concerned about catching him anymore. It was like, how do I keep from falling down here? And I remember at that point in time licking my chops at the possibility. Dickerson's flashy play on the field belied a young man who liked to keep to himself, who bought a house high in the Malibu Canyon an almost two hour commute to practice. At the time, it was next to a big open kind of pasture that had a whole lot of horses. So he said it made him kind of feel like he was in Texas. Eric is a country boy from a country town, Sealy, Texas. Sealy is like this big. And you can like get around Sealy in like five minutes. <laughs> Sealy's a cow town, known for the Sealy Pasta mattress, but really it's nothing there. 
after the games, when I was in high school, we go to the 7 Eleven. You know, that's where all the kids would go. Yeah, it is right there. It's called the Sealy Fuel Express. It's 7 Eleven right there. It was not a lot to do. We'd go out and chase cows at night, you know, for fun. Seriously. It's a football town. On the left side, probably about halfway down, that's where my mom and dad used to sit. Every time I come in to run and work out, I still look over there where they used to sit at. At heart, Dickerson was a mama's boy, even though the woman who raised him wasn't his biological mother. My situation is that I was legally adopted from inside of my family. My mother, Viola, she was really my great, great aunt. Everybody knew us as Aunt Red, and her husband was my dad, Gary Dickerson. My real mother lived right next door, Helen. They told me that was my sister, so I always thought she was my sister. But my parents had a big impact. My dad was a good man. And I always say if I could be half the man my dad is, I'd be a good man. I can still see him sitting sitting right here. He'd come out here before the games and sit here and read his Bible. He wasn't a sports guy. I mean, he wanted me to do well at it. That, that's one thing he said. His, his saying to me, and he, all I remember this saying like it was yesterday, all you do, do what you might. Things done by halves are never done right. So he said, if you're going to do it, do it 100%. And I, I try to play it 100%. Dickerson had the greatest rookie season a running back has ever had, rushing for 1,808 yards and 18 touchdowns. He set his sights on an even bigger record in 1984.